So it's a, it's a privilege, first of all, to, to be here in your town, to be invited in by African Enterprise, and to partner with a friend, Stephen, over this time to share the truth around God. Coming from different sides, different parts of conflicts in a certain nation, Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, and, and knowing that God is greater than anything else that we find that could be politically challenging. The reasons why men fight is because they're insecure with what they have. And so they reach out to try and get what they have. And in the process, they hurt each other. Um, maybe I need to put this in the front, right? Because of the aerial. And so I just want to quickly share with some things with your thoughts with you. I do honor and respect the military that may be here, the chaplains and those of you who are a part of the military, just to kind of bring a bit of a, a background of, of what the Slew Scouts were, were about. So just to, to bring that to you, I looked up in Wikipedia, it said it was the most effective special forces ever in history for the period of time that it existed. And when you put them above the Navy SEALs, it kind of makes you a little scared. And I think the reason why they do that is why they said that is because of the amount of kills, which is not proud to announce, the amount of kill rate that they had and the amount of losses on our side was so vast and far between that no other unit in the, in the world has ever had that incredible difference. In the seven years of existence of this unit, 80% were black soldiers, 20% were white. So it was mostly consisted of of exceptionally good black soldiers. Of the only 15% of the volunteers who ever wanted to make it in through the selection course, only 15% passed. So if you had 120 people line up and start off on the day of the selection to become a part of this thing, only 15% would get there. And I remember being an instructor on a number of these selection courses. Um, I remember seeing probably 12 or 8 out of 120 cross the line and then be interviewed to see if they qualified to become and were mentally correct and had the right attitude to become a Sanu Scout. So there was a massive pressure and of course as a result of this there's a massive effect that this had. The basic entry level soldier would have 18 months of continuous training and that started from being someone who leaves school go and do their nine months training, come out of that, then volunteer to go into Special Forces. And so that's one thing I love about the Special Forces, you were never asked to come, it was your choice. And I think in Christianity it's very much that same way too, you can become born again, but if you want to go somewhere, and you want to see the powers of God work through your life, it's your choice. It's not going to automatically happen, it's a step that you take. And I think for me, that was a step I chose to take. And of course, in the military, there's a lot of the side where you can wear the uniform, the belt and the beret, and be one of the number of one of the elite in the country. But sometimes the consequences of what you face and do, you're never told until you have to face them. And that is literally you know, taking a human life. And that is not always taught. You're never given that. You're given the fact that, hey, you're one of those guys, and you go through all the training, and it's exciting. But the outcome of that is to use that and it's not always nice. I have this saying, soldiers are trained to save lives, but in the process may have to take lives. It depends on the motive or the reason why you're a soldier. And that comes down to an arena of politics which I don't want to get into. We were trained at a camp called Wafa Wafa, shown a name which means who, he who dies, dies, he who stays behind, stays behind. So I think that alone in itself kind of tells you the training ground that we were in and the whole water. One thing too about being a part of this unit that and I'm going to end off with this is that when you joined, when you volunteered to become a part of that unit, you could be a sergeant in the special air services, the SAS or the RLI. You could be any rank in those other units. When you joined the Slew Scouts, you lost every bit of rank. You started at the bottom. 
And the reason behind that is you don't come with your baggage. You don't come with your way of doing things. You don't come with your little pet thing. Well, in our church, we do this. You know what it's like when you change churches? It's the same kind of thing, isn't it? You come across, I'm the deacon in the church. And in our church, we do this. Well, hang on, guys. Drop your bag at the door. Come in and submit and just love God and get back to truth. And so the principles of these things are very patterned and familiar in training. So some guys would fail on the selection course. Second day, how do you make a base camp? Hey, excuse me, Sarge. We have done this in the Rhodesian Light Infantry and the SSV. That's basic 101 training, how to set up a base camp. Now, when you're at Salu Scouts, this is how we set up a base camp. It's the same thing. It's just repeated. But the fact that if they had up and say, we've done this, come on, we, 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 we're special soldiers already, and we have to learn this basics again? Mm. Yeah, you see, if you refuse to let go of what you have, to be trained into something new, you're unteachable, unbeatable. And that's a great principle in life, in that. And so we'd actually say, you failed, just on that, because we can't talk to you. You, you seem to know better, so you can't lead you. And we can't, we don't have that out there. And I, I think, you know, if the Holy Spirit wants to lead you in life, you've got to let go of what previous influences that you've had, denominational backgrounds. You've got to leave those behind and say, God, it's you afresh. You're all in you. So, again, just to end off, what did we train in? Infiltration techniques into foreign territories, weapon handling, and that is from pistols to anti-aircraft caliber weapons. And if I name, name some ladies, you're going to lose this 12.5 millimeter, 14.5 millimeter, and 20 millimeter. You got that, man. You know exactly what that is. You know? Just think of bigger microwaves. You know, you can speak more in it. And, and uh, parachute training, high level, and other means of warfare and special forces operations. We were trained in survival, tra tracking, anti-tracking, and dark phase. Now that's a whole lot of stuff to us to think. What is that? Believe me, it's stuff. And the whole idea is to go to war. When you say survival, what did you survive with? Well, I remember eating a python. Smells like chicken, tastes like fish. It could be the other way around. It was cold, it was floating down the stream. <laughs> and this thing was going nowhere, so it was an easy catch. And when you're hungry, you don't care what it looks like, tastes like, and how it's served. You just want to eat. And it's funny, when you catch a python, you've got it hanging around your neck, like I also called a negavon. Walked into a whole bunch of guys doing our selection course survival site. I had a whole lot of friends that I never knew I had, you know. You went, oh, yeah, I, yeah, great, and look at that. Because I know they want a free meal from, from it. So it's, it's amazing what stuff does. And we ate this thing. And by the way, grasshoppers are good to eat. You just pull the head off and eat the rest. <laughs> Crunchy on the inside, outside, meltdown on the inside, <laughs> and, and it's, it survived. When you're hungry, you can eat stuff, rats, grubs, grasshoppers, tortoises, don't ever eat them. Because when they come out the shell, they look like a very old man running down the street with pajamas way too big for it. <laughs> you got the picture. So, but when you're hungry, you eat them. So the whole part of it is just to, so that when you deploy out there special forces, you don't say, hello, I'm hungry. Can you bring a helicopter in and drop me some supplies? And can you just chuck in some ice cream with it? No, you survive. And that is when really puts you in a place where you're able to handle the situation. The scouts were born out of the tracker combat unit which were 39, 30, sorry, 32 men who were in tracker combat units. Put you on the ground, you can track someone. And we pretty much were able to track them through over anything, so long as it was daytime. That then melted into the first training group of the Slew Scouts, the first selection course, I was a part of that. And so basically it became one of the first 30, one guy failed, his attitude was wrong, failed him became one of the first 31 groups of the certain group of the Salute Scouts. Myself and two other guys, we were the first to go operational in the north of our country. So when we pitch up at a military base, they say, who are you guys? We're Salute Scouts. What Scouts? 
and normally get a whole lot of other names before the scouts, before they understood who the three scouts were. And, and so whenever we were called, whenever we were, whenever we were deployed, it was a phone call at any time of the day or night. And you had three hours to be in base, and you didn't know where you were going, what you were going to do, or when, or if you were going to come back. Because you volunteered. Christianity is like that, friends. If you want to see stuff, volunteer. So I've taken a lot of the military of what I learned and put it into Christianity and they fit pretty close together. And so when you want to see God move and see the sick healed under your hands, feel bones and joints realign themselves under your hands, what you're just doing is laying hands on the sick, God heals the sick. And when you take your hands off that person's heel, when that happens to you, you're never the same again. You become a weapon in his hand. He's the weapon in your hand. And you see people change. And so, that's what we do. Why? What happened in my life in, in to bring this change in my life? Well, I was raised at a school in Rhodesia in those days called Rizawi School. And um, it was a church school. It was Anglican based. There was a padre there. The boys, I was about four or five years old in preschool. They would go to school, they would go to church every night, six at night time, and probably six in the morning, I forget the actual time, but they'd go to church and you'd hear them sing hymns. And I, I lived about 50 meters away from the chapel, so as a young kid of five, I could sing all the hymns because I knew them. It's like part of life. And I thought everybody else had that kind of life. So I was raised in a religious, not Christian, religious upbringing. I heard about would read the Bible to my, my sister and I, and uh, he would do that on a Sunday, so he would climb, and I would never forget it, the tree house. We went up into this tree house. We went onto the little platform. He sat at the trap door, so there was no exit until he moved, so we were trapped. But he would read the Bible to us, and we loved it, sitting up there on a Sunday, him, he was not born again. He just had the Bible. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He wasn't saved. He didn't know all the details, but he'd tell us the stories and try and explain what was going on to us as we had questions. And of course, the Old Testament, we, my sister and I, knew, knew all the stories. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus, hero. Little kid that age. He was a massive hero. The stuff, stuff he did. For who else does that in the world? But the thing is, he died, he hung on the cross, and he said one thing, which stuck in my mind at that young age, it was this, into thy hands, O Father, I commit my spirit. And he died. I didn't know if this, or when it would ever happen, that I say that, but I settled in my heart, when I care and die, I'm going to say that. It's like one of those little things that I have. So I was raised in that environment, so I then went into the military and uh, we did our nine months training straight out of school before you could get married, before you got a job, before you could go to university, you had to go and do military. So it wasn't worth getting married, it wasn't worth looking for a girlfriend, it just wasted time because you'd never develop and while you're gone someone else pulls in and you know, he messes you and you're out there worrying about who's the dude with my girlfriend, I'm not getting back home. So, so I didn't want to carry that kind of stuff, so I didn't get involved with girls. I just thought, nice at a distance, and we just hung around as guys. And our, our entertainment was go to the gym eight days a week, just keep fit and strong so that you survive out there. So, so, so we also did, we went into this, as I said earlier, this training. So there's one occasion in this that, um, that changed my life completely. So you can have a religious upbringing. It doesn't mean to say you're a Christian. I had religion. Boy, did I know it. I knew the Anglican stuff. Nothing wrong with the Anglican. I knew when the bell would ring. I was raised at a mission, colonial upbringing. The whites are different. I was raised, my, my, my buddies when I was a kid were Shaniwa, Gideon, and I forget the other name. Two little guys that I used to go hunting with, two little black guys. Those are my friends who go and disappear into the bush for two, for two nights. My parents didn't fuss, they knew we were safe. We were around six, seven, out there with a pellet gun, two Alsatians, we'd sleep in a cave, 
that was my life, my upbringing. I understood that. So, so culture wasn't a threat to me. I was taught it. I had to fight it. I had to. I was told things that I, I didn't really see, but that was their impressions. And so you get this thing called racism. You get this thing called in South Africa apartheid, which I never was a part of because I lived up there. Came down here, it was over. And, and, and uh, so, but it's some of it. It's, it's, it's not loving your brother. It's this thing that you're taught about. They're not good enough. You better. Or they don't do this. We do this. That. All this stuff. And then we chucked out there with weapons. Say so you can't do this. You must stop them. So. So there I was. I was brainwashed. And believe me, there is a brainwashing that goes on. So here we come. These phone calls. We'd be at work. We didn't have cell phones then. Be at work, worked at the veterinary laboratory up in Harare. And uh, often I'd get a phone call there and I'd go straight to the senior pathologist and say, Sir, I've been caught. He said, Go away, come back again. Make sure you come back. Phone my wife. Hey, on my honeymoon, I was called out. You're one of 30 guys in the country. When they want you, they want you. You see, when God wants you, He wants you. You can't say, Excuse me, I'm on leave. Excuse me, I'm too busy. Oh, I've got this thing to do, Lord. Can... No, you see, when you choose to go further in God, He will bring your number at any time. The thing is, are we available? And I think I've lived my life in the military doing that and putting it into Christianity. I'm available to go to any nation, to go and preach wherever, to where no one wants to go. So it's not about me, it's about Him. But the surrender has to come. How am I doing in the time? Okay. So. So I get this phone call. Guess what happens? There is nothing like it, hey Lawrence, when you get that phone call. They say, um, do you get butterflies? <laughs> butterflies and eagles. And all kinds of vultures flying around. You get everything flying inside of you when that call comes. Because you don't know what you're going to go to, but you get dressed at home. You get all your kits at home. I had every, I had three AK-47s in my home. I had plastic explosive, all kinds of grenades, the RBD-7 rockets. Click. You know, ladies, you got it? Fine. You're, you're amazing. So, so I've got this stuff that you have in your pantry. It's in my pantry. And you walk into base, you're never told, you finally deploy on the plane, in the back of a truck, at the edge of the border. This is why you're here. And this occasion I got a call. It was... Um, about us going across into what they call the Nyadzonia raid, you can Google it, it's there. And um, you, you, we, we're going to go into this camp. What we did, there were 70 of us, roughly. We had Unimogs, we had uh, weapons on there, MAG um, weapons. We had a 12.7, we had a 20mm Hispano belt fed machine gun taken out of a, the Canberra Bombers Second World War and uh, MiG 58s and all that kind of stuff on these vehicles. These vehicles were painted the very same colour of the nation's army that we were going into, Frelimo. We were dressed Frelimo. The white guys, we had black hoods on, gloves on, so we couldn't be detected except for the colour of our eyes, which did give us away. So, very few of us white guys, most of the black guys, were on this convoy to go into Mozambique. It's on the web, so there's no use hiding the stuff. We, into Mozambique, where there was a terrorist camp on the Pongi River. Nyadzonia was a little tributary of it. It was set there. We were going to go in there. They had seen it. They were expecting about a thousand terrorists there. But on the day that we went in, there was a, there's a known number of 5,000 people, 72 of us. And so you are there and, and you're told that evening, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go in there, call the officers out, capture them, get the documents, shoot the rest of the people on the ground there. They're all lined up. It's easy to shoot. You just annihilate humanity so easily. Just this movement. And you take lives. They think you're with them. See, nothing is fair in war. Nothing... Can they ever teach you at a military academy that that's what you might have to do? And you're under orders.
And you have to pay. So I was on this 20 millimeter. Shoot bullets this long, that thick. When it hits something, it explodes. So four bullets into a wall here, you've got a doorway. That's how powerful that thing is. And you're using that on humanity. Can you imagine the effect of that? You can never be trained on that. See, Saving Private Ryan, uh, Hacksaw Ridge, the sound effect and the so visual, visuals of what you see, my friends, I have been there. I have literally been there. So, we, 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 go, we, we told this, we get onto the vehicles, we start traveling down 8 o'clock in the morning, it's the 9th of August, 1976, I think it is. We take the hoods off the weapons, we refuel the vehicles. Just before 8 o'clock, we knew that they were going to be on the parade square. Um, in this case, 5,000 of them ready, expecting us. We're going to look like we're coming to support them. We get there, we arrive, second vehicle in with us, 20 mil, because we want all the power up front. Everyone's there. They don't, they, they don't do plan A is what we expected, and I don't want to go into detail of what it is, it's, it's not real. But the fact is that they started running around us, and they were this close. I'm sitting there with an AK-47, the 20 mil here, and they're this close and closer all around us. 5,000 chanting and jumping and excited, thinking that we had come there to support them. And we're sitting there with our fingers on the trigger, special forces, you don't panic and do your own thing, you wait, you're under command. And of course plan A doesn't work, so you know there's going to be a plan B. And suddenly this happens, this 20 mil starts shooting, and the devastation this thing brings on flesh is, is horrific. Um, one bullet, 40 people are shredded. The effect of one bullet. When that thing pumps out three rounds, you can imagine what it is in history, 3,000 died in 20 minutes. <coughs> the rest, if you're wounded, for everyone dead, there's someone wounded. And when you wound, when you're wounded and you bleed, you do get thirsty. So they'll crawl to the river and drink and drink and not survive. And so this is what happened. And I'm sitting there, this is going on, I'm shooting because you're right here, shooting people and and the, the effect of what was going on was, was horrific and in the middle of this I get a bullet and it goes through my right thigh, comes out here and goes through my left knee, tears out half the muscle on my left knee and I'm sitting there, the gun is there and I tell him his expression and his comment to me was not helpful and you're feeling the pain and you don't expect it and it's real and you can't get away, you can't stop everybody, it's, it's happening. And right there and then, I remember what my dad read in the Bible to me and what I promised myself. And I remember that day looking up in the sky and just shouting out, saying, God, if you want my life, you can have it. I did not remember the words exactly. I shouted, I said, God, if you want my life, I could feel death come. Friends, when death comes, it's like you're going to go to sleep and you never know you're going to wake up. So this happened. I shouted out. In a split second, I had an X9 experience where I, I've neglected to read to you in the Bible where Saul was traveling on the road to Damascus and the power and the light of God came upon him and he fell to the ground and those that were with him and he heard God's voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he turns around and says, who are you, Lord? I didn't have that question. I didn't ask the question. I didn't hear a voice of God. I didn't fall to the ground, but I saw that light all around me. The presence of God. The glory of God. No one, I'd never read it in the Bible. My dad had never read Acts 9. But I was in the wars zone with people dying and being shredded in front of me. And I was participating in what was happening. And God showed up in a moment like that. Not in a church with a choir singing at the back and the organ playing and everyone happy. And there's a gentle, sweet presence of God. And everyone singing hallelujah and swinging gently in their blue robes. As the choir sings in unison and that perfect harmony. I'm not mocking church, but this was not church. This was not what you'd expect God to show up in. And I'm bleeding, I'm hurting, and this is happening. And this presence of God shows up in that situation. And I have this one question who that I had never been told about. Who are you, Lord? Who are you, God, that would show up in a war zone? You're not intimidated by 
negativity. You're not intimidated by vaporized blood. You're not intimidated by the roar of guns. But you would dare to show up to one man who's dying would cry out. And you'd answer him. And it's true. Because it says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, healed, and delivered. I was that whosoever. So I shouted that out, and guess what? That happened. I was more attracted to the presence of God there than my wounds, than the war going on. Because He is more real than that. The supernatural is more real than the natural, friends. Mm. The pain left. I was like, God, who are you? I wanna, I've never been told about you. Mm. 34 hours later, I get to a hospital. And uh, at that stage, I'd have five... I think it was five doses of morphine. Believe me, morphine <coughs> is nice when you're sick, when you're hurt. Only then. I had, I don't know how many saline drips and half an orange. I'll never forget John Fletcher, who came up to me and said, here's half an orange. I inhaled that thing. <coughs> Where's the other half? Yeah. He did the other half. So, so, so I'll never forget that. Got to a hospital with pneumonia in both lungs with exposure. Doctor operated. My wife was told three days later. The other guys came home. I didn't. <coughs> the usual story of a military vehicle parking outside the doorway. Two men get dressed up. Officers walking up the driveway. One carrying a Bible. It's the most terrible thing for a wife to see. She saw that. I walked out of that hospital. The doctor said you'd have a permanent limp. Your one leg will be shorter than the other. Oh, look, guess what? You haven't seen me limp, have you? I'm totally healed. And only half a muscle in this knee. And I know God heals. Guess what? I went back. I wanted to know what this is. Who are you, Lord? That can, can change me like this. And, and, and so I, I got the answer. God answers. You know, it doesn't matter what you're going through. If you call on them, he'll answer. He, he, you can tell me all your problems. I've just told you mine. What happened there? You know what? Nothing's too big for him. If you call whoever, whatever it is, he'll answer. I'm just going to leave all that aside and just talk to you about a thing called compassion. This, what I've told you, is the absolute, pure, royalty demonstration of his mercy. That's what changed my life. O oh Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. How many people in the Bible say that? The, the Syrophoenician woman, Bartimaeus, the two blind men, a lot of people in the Bible. Oh Lord, have mercy on me. Why? It's mercy is, you don't deserve it. You know you don't deserve mercy, but God gives it. What do you do? You turn around and say, thank you, Lord, I'll serve you. And that's exactly what happened to me when someone told me, Okay, you did this and this. So what is your response to me? You said, Lord, if you want my life, you can have it. He, he gave it back to you. So what are you going to do with it? It was so easy. Lord, I'm yours. We sang it. But the change was, is he has shown me mercy. I understood what it is to show mercy. Because what you give, what you get, you can give. So I had all this... Clutter, the stuff in my brain, the sewerage about humanity, about racism, about that stuff. Suddenly, I had to deal with this thing to let it get out of me. One occasion, I was in Mozambique. I went back in there, been get, went back in there for 12 years, going and preaching the gospel. Saw over 21,000 people in one year alone saved, doing open air crusades in every little village in Hamlet where no one dares to go. I went there. You can change the military experience and put it into a good. You can take a lemon, put fizz in it, and make lemonade. You see, the some of the negative things in your life, you can totally change around. And, and so, so I went in there, and I remember going into one place, flew in again by aircraft, under radar, um, their radar. We didn't have GPS, so it was a compass bearing, and you had to work out wind drift. Landed on a dirt road, chickens flying, get off of the, get out of the aircraft, get onto a motorcycle, head somewhere, I don't know, with Frenemo guys with AK-47s behind you, this way, that way, okay. And I don't know where it was, we got to a place where there were 400 pastors. And we stayed there, we camped. In the middle of nowhere, I don't know where it is on the map to this day. 400 leaders have got there, I don't know how they got there. No cell phones, no bush telegraph, there were no telephones, they got there. To hear the word. 
And what a privilege. Amen. One night, an old lady and a young girl, she carried a basket, which is prosperity at that time. Basket. The young girl just had a little loincloth. Bare, bare breasted, bare chested, that's all they had. Just a loincloth in the front, nothing, that's it. And a basket, walking through the bush, lost. Orphans of warfare, of what goes on in violence. No husband died. No little brothers dead. Sleeping in the bush at night with wild animals. And they have an encounter with God, as the one person, the old lady said. She said, I was told to walk towards the setting sun. Because if I did that, I'd find help. So for two days, she kept walking towards the setting sun. And then she found us camping there. That's where we were. She came out of wherever. Sure. Four o'clock in the afternoon, she arrives with this old, this little girl staggering and sits down and finally gets hold of the pastor who's organizing the meeting of these leaders and said, we've come, we're hungry. He says, please, Lizzie, just wait. I'm going to get to you. He never did. 400, no, I was going to say one. 100, not even 100 meters away. We had water, we had medica medication, we had clothing, we had food. Four essentials of life. He forget, forgot to say, just go down there. See that fire down there? Where those people are? Just go there. That night, something happened. And I'll summarize it this way. That, that day, I was, I was teaching uh, at about 11 o'clock in the morning, we get interrupted. Man walks and talks to my interpreter and says, somebody has just died. And when, when somebody has just died in Mozambique, you, you guess what? There's no fridges, so you're going to have to deal with that person quickly. So we finished the session and I said to him, where's the person who's died? Where are the relatives? He didn't say much to me. We walked out and uh, came to a little hut on the edge of uh, this area where these leaders were. Sitting at the entrance of the doorway of the hut was this old lady just sitting there, looking into the bush. Just looking up. Didn't even acknowledge us when we went in front. Hopeless, helpless, visionless. Nothing to live for. I walked into the hut and there was this little girl. Stone dead, fetal position, lying on a goat skin. Her body was so thin I could fly. <coughs> Fingers around her neck, she's about 12 years old. She was cold. And I remember leaning down there looking at this girl and thinking, as we do as Christians, raise her from the dead. And in my half of my thoughts were saying, to what? What, is, what are you going to raise her to? And yet I was so cut up by the fact that someone had neglected to tell her to go. They had attended to her. And I asked the pastor next to me, I said, what's her name? Where did she come from? I don't know. Where's her parents? Is that her relative? And I looked at him in the end and I suddenly realized that he didn't know anything. And we were both sitting there looking at this young girl and I had a, such an emotional experience in my heart. I saw his tear hit the ground next to me first, off his cheek. And then I stood up and walked out and I walked around in the bush for about half an hour with the questions that you'd have in your heart, God, why? Why, why? Didn't someone say, go there? And I understood, I think, what God said, and He whispered to me, He said, Kira, you're feeling what I feel about lost humanity when you go. And I got an understanding of compassion and a working of what compassion is. Compassion and mercy are two words that almost mean the same. Whenever Jesus did anything, he was moved with compassion and fed the 4,000. He was moved with compassion and called them together and they prayed for them. This thing called compassion is what this nation needs more than anything else. What we need to have birthed in our hearts, friends, is this mercy, the mercy of God. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, might, and, and everything. And then you can love your neighbor as yourself. When we try and love our neighbor as ourselves with our own strength, you know what? You haven't got it. He has it. When you get it, you can give it. Such as you have to give. And I've learned this one thing. Of all the hate and everything that I had, I realized that I can walk out 
and not allow anything to be a barrier between me and anyone else. This town's name is, is um, Friedenberg. Do you know what that name means? Peaceful town. Why? Because there was a spring here, and that's why this town started. It was called Quarrel Spring at one time, because people would come here and quarrel over whose water it was. Then it was called Lawsuit Spring, this town, because people would come here and they want to cast lawsuits against each other. But actually it's called a peaceful town. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, when he came to the woman at the well in Samaria, some area, Samaria, it was a well. Why? Why was there a well? Because the whole town existed for the well. This town exists because there was a well there. And what was it? Who, you, you shouldn't be talking to me to give you a drink of water. Because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. You shouldn't talk to each other. What is that? Straight away, racial conflict right there. Right there at the well. Source of life. The town exists for life. I mean, the well exists for the town. What is it that this country needs that it needs to bring unity is the fact that there needs to be a source of eternal life where Jesus says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. When she was uncovered and she'd had five husbands, five moves of God, six, in fact, the one she's living with was not, six moves of God, six types of leadership, six governments, six, whatever you want to put in there, six is an earthly number. Jesus was a seventh, the perfect man. The woman is like the church. The disciples of the future leadership that are gone and filled their bellies on what they can get out of this ministry. The woman represents the church or community. Husbands represent whatever there is that's not working because there's no real relationship. There's no mention of children. There's no fruitfulness. But she brings the whole town to him. It's called revival. Amen. I tell you what, South Africa needs revival. Would you, my friends, would you be a source of that revival? Would you be someone that would say, I want that river in my life. I want to see that change in my life. And I just want to leave you with this before we close. General Powell said this. The most important thing I learned is that soldiers watch what their leaders do. You can give them classes and lecture them forever. But it is your personal example they will follow. Friends, it's not about Sunday mornings. It's about what happens during the streets. Mm -hmm. It's a personal example in the stores and supermarkets. Mm -hmm. It's not just, oh, when I feel nice. No. It's watching your leaders. And that's again to us leaders. I'm pointing to myself to bring a change. Abraham Lincoln said, nearly all men can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man's character, give him power. And you'll see his character. Mm -hmm. And finally, Marcus Aurelius, your days are numbered. Use them to throw open the windows of your soul to the sun. If you do not, the sun will soon, soon set and you with it. Open your hearts to this wonderful man, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what your background is, like mine. But when he gets you, he can change you. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, I pray that this morning, this evening, that you touch every person's heart in a way of power and authority. <clears throat> Let there be a heart of reconciliation. Lord, break in into our lives. Break in to the crustiness of our attitude. Lord, would you spring up a spring in this town again of expectancy? of your presence. Wash us afresh. Fill us afresh. And Lord, as the fall brought one paralyzed man through the roof of a house to the feet of Jesus, Lord, would you break and shatter our ceilings to cause those who are paralyzed in spiritual ability to be able to stand up and walk again and be reconciled to you and to be an effective weapon your hand, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.